You're listening to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, aimed at helping photographers learn how to make the leap from amateur to pro. Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, a joint effort brought to you by PhotoFocus and Skip Cohen University. This is Shamira Young and I am joined by my co-host Skip Cohen, my dynamic co-host Skip Cohen. How are wow. you, Skip? Once again, I've made it to dynamic. You just came up off the top hey, of my head. Hey, I'm great. So true. I'm great. Um, it is a, and I always do this because you live in Detroit and I don't. <laughs> it is a bone chilling 60 degrees this morning. I even, oh even check with goodness. Sheila to say, you know, do you want me to light a fire? And it's going to be 80 today. That's the what? amazing thing about this time of year. I don't know how you survive 60 it's, degrees. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, we've got a great topic today. Yes. Want to hear about it? I absolutely do. I was hoping you would ask. So we're going to talk about the important role a great website plays in building a stronger business. And we've got a terrific guest to share his thoughts today. Scott Detweiler is in the Mind Your Own Biz house today. He started as an artist and painter, but brought his style and skills into photography just a few years ago. He's based in Milwaukee, so I'll be making fun of the weather that he's dealing with along with what you've got to deal with. <laughs> But he's now focused mostly on commercial and fashion work, as well as being a noted educator and a friend to so many other photographers in the industry. The other part of this is that, and this is what I love, I think, the most, Scott also believes in giving back to the industry. And there's a quote I loved in his bio that I'm just going to read. Quote, I love passing on my knowledge to those who are now facing similar frustrations with the technical aspects of this awesome artistic outlet, close quote. And that pretty much describes Scott, and we've had a couple of phone conversations, and each one comes out like, wow, I feel like this is somebody I've known for years and years. And we do share a lot of mutual friends. So, Scott, welcome to Mind Your Own Business, and here it is, <laughs> time for your lips to move. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> oh, I keep wanting to find a new closing line, and there's nothing that works as good as time for your lips to move. There you go. That's a big hint. There it is. Scott, we are so thrilled to have you on the show. And your work is outstanding. You are versatile. And I just can't wait to dig into the nuts and bolts of your business and your creativity. But I do want to start it off with our favorite first basic question. Give us a rundown of how you got started, your background, and just how you ended up doing what you're doing today. Oh, sure. It's a, kind of a convoluted story, as most of them are. <laughs> um, so I, I was... Um... So to kind of get going past physics, so that's where I started. Um, during the Desert Storm, I was uh, an illustrator and a uh, what's it called a security physicist on uh, some projects. And uh, one of the illustrators, the the main illustrator, uh, disappeared. And uh, obviously, he was over in Kuwait, and I was not. I was here in the states. And then I inherited all of that that uh, illustration work. Mm. And so architectural illustration was a big part of that. And I was also doing a lot of 3D at the time, um, which was you know, pretty early on. But that was also kind of in the prison and uh, the criminal justice industry. And uh, so uh, along came a project to build a prison in downtown. I think it was Minneapolis at the time. And they had to take photos of the area. And then you would illustrate the building into that uh, scene so they could kind of say, yes, it's going to you know, not look like an eyesore in the middle of the downtown. Uh, so I started doing more and more photography. It was, I was working into the illustrations and the 3D work. And then uh, fast forward many years later, I, I actually, there's a whole blurry area in the middle there where I worked for Microsoft for a while. I owned my own software company. I did a whole bunch of other technical stuff. And wow. um, I came back to about 40 years old, my, my midlife crisis present. My <laughs> wife's like, what do you want to do? <laughs> You've got a budget. And I said, well, I'm either going to buy a drum kit or I'm going to buy a camera. <laughs> So we looked at a bunch of drums and we looked at a bunch of cameras and I ended up with a Nikon D80 and that was the start of it. So, I love it. There you wow. go. You've done a lot. Yeah, that's a there's a there's a lot of of other weird history in there from owning a homebrewing and home making store to I mean you know there's all kinds of crazy stuff in there. I like business. Put it that way. Well, there's a great line that I've used at it. Usually it's at. Well, it's at retirement parties and funerals. Um, <laughs> it's by Alfred Lord Tennyson, and the line is just, I'm a part of all that I've met. Mm. And I don't think people realize um, that no matter how scattered or random your career seemed to be, 
everything that you've done up to this point right now has made you who you are. Mm. Mm-hmm. And there are all these little lessons that we learn from our past. And so often people want to just ignore their past and say, well, I went down that road and that was a definite mistake. And then I went this way. But the reason that you knew it was a mistake and the reason you appreciate it today is because of that past. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all of those things you did. And as you were sitting there talking about um, the criminal doing stuff in criminal justice, I'm I'm thinking about TV shows where they're always looking for somebody that's got the blueprints to break out of the prison. Mm-hmm. Um, you're the one that has it for some prison in Minneapolis. So, yeah, I actually I did all yeah. the illustrations for a couple of air bases in Kuwait that are still actually things there I cannot go. show in my portfolio. Wow! Yeah. Wow! That's very that uh, that but that's very cool. And that's where when I look at a lot of your images, that's where that mix of of pen and ink uh, as an artist. Um, comes through in so much. I mean, you mentioned pen and ink and acrylic. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes through in your work. That's mm-hmm. that's very cool. You know, an odd, an odd little fact there is I didn't even know I was allowed to say the name of the airbase until I'm watching the movie Iron Man, and he <laughs> says the name of the airbase. And I was like, oh, I guess that's not top secret anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. Wow. Yeah. There, there you go. Thank you. Well, let's, let's, let's jump in uh, to talking about how you show your work and just let's hit on some of what are some of the key elements that you found are effective in getting people to um, see your work and understand who Scott Detweiler is? Well, I, I think uh, there are, obviously the two big ones are going to be physical prints and an online presence and uh, physical prints. So a lot of the, the fine art stuff that I do um, hangs in different galleries or, or was actually hanging in a lot more galleries before COVID, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of that, uh, the, some of those galleries did not survive or have changed their, their ways a bit. Uh, and with the advent of NFTs and so on, I've, I've kind of shifted that business as well, too. So my NFTs are sold with, you know, a gallery sized print, and that's the only one I'm selling. So I'm kind of embracing that, uh, going that direction. Um, the website stuff is obviously where, you know, people find you or find, you know, if I'm looking uh, for a boudoir photographer or a fine art photographer, then they're going to find me through those. And I've been uh, a Zenfolio customer forever, which is the, who I use for all that that stuff. Um, they've been well, actually. I should, take, I should take that back. Briefly, I was I was uh, I was uh, negotiated away from Zenfolio, and I won't mention the name of the company. Let's just say it's a very rhymy name. And uh, about that lasted about two months, and then I came back to Zenfolio, and I said, <laughs> "I'm so sorry. That was a that was a horrible mistake." Um, <laughs> And they had me write a really long blog, I'm sorry, post about wow. all the things that was right and wrong with the other solution and what was best about their solution. Um, so that was really kind of funny. And so they, they were very kind about taking me back. But, uh, yeah, I'm very happy with them. But that the ability to be found by Google, I, I, a lot of people say, like, why well, you, know, you don't do a lot of Facebook advertising. I'm like, if you ever, like, needed a plumber on Facebook, do you ever look at the ads for a plumber? You don't. You, you jump into a group and go, does anybody know a plumber? Um, or you go to Google and you type in plumbers near me. So I think Facebook advertising for me has never been a focus. Mm. It's always been, I need to use Google. I need to be prominent there. And so the, the search engine optimization for what I'm producing, I want to do it quickly, but I want to be noticed. And that's really kind of why I, again, I came back to Zenfolio and I've been leaning on them for, geez, I don't even know how long now, way over a decade. Well, it's interesting because I don't think people realize, and this this would have happened regardless, but today, especially because of the pandemic, there are more people online than ever before. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen our our Amazon account skyrocket because there's so much that during the pandemic, rather than me running out to a store to shop, um, especially when it was at its worst, um, we'd look on Amazon and we'd find what we needed and we'd consolidate our packages and I heard stories of people leaving packages outside for 24 hours to make sure the the yeah. virus had dissipated into the air and was gone. But mm-hmm. I don't think people realize that today your your website is the equivalent of a stunning, or it should be the equivalent of a stunning bricks and mortar storefront mm-hmm. because there's so many people that are shopping online and it started with, it, it skyrocketed because of the pandemic, but it's never... It, now it's at a point where it's just not going to slow down, and you need that 
you need that element. You gotta, you've got to have that presence. Mm -hmm. Well, and you and I had had a brief conversation too about how many pictures. Like I have a lot of pictures on my website, and that's normally not a good idea. Normally, you want to show only your best work, and you don't want to hint, oh, well, I don't have a good black and white, but I have a mediocre black and white. But I want to show that I do black and white. I'll, I'll put this one up there, and that's a, a huge strategy mistake. And uh, I, I think that I see a lot of that, even though people have have you know good platforms the strategy behind what they're putting on those sites can sometimes be a little spurious. You know, it's like focus on what you're really good at. Don't mislead the customer, you know, show only your best work. You know, and if you do that, you'll attract the right kind of customer. Well, what I've been saying for years is that every print you want to show, and I know I said this to you already, but you know, this is in the podcast. Um, <laughs> every print you show in your gallery needs to be a wild print. That means that each print by itself is so good, it's the only print you'd have to show to get hired. Mm -hmm. And that's what people forget about. And you sit there and think, you know, they'll sit there and think it's quantity, not quality. And the next thing you know, you've got too many images that look like something anybody's Uncle Harry could have grabbed. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and it gets, I think that also gets very difficult too. And it's like, I do a lot of boudoir work. It's probably about 30 to 40% of, of the work that I shoot is boudoir. And that I have a separate website just for that branding because people obviously can't differentiate. Oh, well, you shoot high school seniors and you shoot boudoir. Well, yeah, but I don't mix the two. I don't want I don't want like I have daughters. Right. So I don't want sexy senior photos ever. Uh, so I have to have two separate brands for that. But the, the boudoir brand is is more difficult, too, because you have to find a client who's willing to let their images be shown, mm. you know, to say, here's what I can photograph. You know, so if, if you're looking for a specific you know, type of client, um, you have to show pictures of that type of client. You've got to convince them to say, hey, let's take these extremely intimate images and make them public so I can get more business. That's sometimes a tough sell in that market. I can imagine. Wow. I can imagine. And you mentioned, um, so you have a separate site for that. Just curious, how many how many different websites do you have for your work? Well, I currently have four. Okay. And uh, so they are their boudoir work, high school seniors and families work, which I don't, I'm not, a, I maybe shoot like maybe 20 or 30 seniors a year. I'm not, it's not really my, my primary market. But um, because we are, you know, in a city that has a school very close and my daughters went to that school, I still know a lot of people. So I still have to have you know, information available for them. Uh, the boudoir work obviously has its own site. Um, and then the pricing is a little bit different for each of those too, mm -hmm. uh, because I do a lot of work with breast cancer diagnosis, for example, and I want those people to have a much easier time getting pictures before they go through this trauma in their life. Um, so that pricing is different than say some of the other ones. And then I have one for my product and commercial work. So I shoot a lot of, of hair dryers and curling irons and highly reflective things. I've done um, I work, I've got work for American Girl. I've worked for Marshall Fields. I've got all this kind of bizarre commercial work. Again, much of it cannot be shown uh, because of, of different, you know, uh, releases for different things. But trying to represent that and uh, to growing that 3D market, like right now, it's, it's kind of interesting is a lot of the product I'm shooting isn't here. Um, it's stuck on a barge somewhere in the ocean. So I'm sent the CAD files. And then I'm using a, a couple other Adobe products that people aren't often familiar with, Adobe Substance Designer and Adobe Substance Painter, to create what looks like a completely realistic photograph of an image uh, of, of a, a product I do not have because the boxes need to be printed now. So when the product finally gets here, they can put it in the box and send it off to Target or Walmart or whatever. So I've been doing a lot more. Wow. That, that 3D work from way back when is now starting to kind of rear up again. Like, like Skip had said, those those past environments or those past moments are now taking place. And I see that actually going forward a lot more, especially again with that NFT, uh, that whole marketplace is developing. That 3D skill set is starting to become a little more prominent now. So I'm starting to mix the two a lot. And then the third one, uh, I'd say the, the fourth one is, um, I say, did I cover all four? I did, I covered all four. So we're all good. I got them. <laughs> I did, yeah. check them off. Wow, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Um, and I see why you would want to have those separate because they are very different things. And, mm -hmm. and I assume they're all Zenfolio sites. Uh, one is not, and I'm actually in the process of converting that now. And, gotcha. and I think the main reason I have them as, as separate sites is you really only get a chance to say you're the expert at one thing according right. to how Google works. And if you've got four things, then it's four really watered down results instead of one strong result for that one. So as far as investment goes, you know, a lot of people put a lot of marketing money into in, in using one site. I think it'd be more intelligent to put 
money into four sites and a quarter of the marketing money. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. And so looking at your Zenfolio sites, uh, what are so, you mentioned the SEO power that you have. Mm-hmm. That's really helpful. But are there any other features, like favorite features as well, uh, with your Zenfolio sites as far as showing your work, working with clients, making business easier? Yeah, I... Early on, I was doing this a lot more than I am now, but I used to sell a lot of my prints through Zenfolio for my fine artwork. So mm. I'd have fine art level pricing on there. So it's a few hundred dollars to get in you know, a decent sized print and I would sign them and, you know, and, and send them out. So they'd be shipped twice. Uh, but I really liked the fact that if a person didn't want it signed, I had no interaction other than I just receive a check. They just bought it online and it was shipped directly to them. You know, things like playing cards and, and whatever, however you want to display your images, you know, it's up to each each photographer but I was playing a lot more with that and then I started to get into the galleries and the galleries the physical galleries obviously don't want you to have competition where you know you can buy the print online or buy it from them Uh, you can't play that game so (laughs) and especially when you get into the I only want 10 of these prints ever to exist because now they're limited edition Um, I want to I want to lean more toward a physical gallery presence because that obviously opens the market to I'm also looking for someone to shoot families, family photos of this or, you know, my, my high school senior and they've got money to walk into a gallery. That's a great customer to find. So I kind of moved away from that and more toward the physical gallery. Obviously, before COVID, uh, that was kind of the direction I was taking. This is a perfect segue to talk about relationship building a little bit because you mentioned that, you know, Zenfolio took you back. Um, and which is which is a funny way to put it, but I don't think people understand the importance of the relationship you have with every vendor that you work with. Mm-hmm. But in addition to that, you mentioned in your in your bio um, the the resources you have in your community with stylists and makeup artists and other people involved in the business. And then that ties to me that ties back into people you've worked with. Um, in terms of your your site development, what are some of the things you you you've done over the years that you feel really help contribute to building relationships? Because people have also heard me say, and and Shamero too, that relationship building is your greatest marketing tool, not just with your clients, but with mm-hmm. everybody that you work with and everybody you need support from. Well, I I think um, getting relationships with hair and makeup is critical, especially if you're a boudoir photographer or, or if you're looking to make your high school seniors look phenomenal. Um, having those relationships are great. The, the, the thing that they encounter, uh, I guess that whole, can we make everybody happy type of, of solution is a lot of those hair and makeup artists never get a chance to do anything really outrageously creative. You know, they're asked to come in and curl or straighten or, you know, do something you say, Hey, we're going mean, to, so I've been, I've been body painting for about, I think six years now. I want to do a body paint and I'm still learning and still trying to do, you know, that techniques and and taking that art and applying it to a human, but I don't do the hair and makeup, you know, so I'm trying to find a hair and makeup artist who wants a chance to do something really creative and they are lining up. They're like, let me have a chance to put something in my portfolio that is not typical so that I can turn heads just like photographers who want to do something that is unique. So we stick out from the people who just have cell phones and are, you know, everybody's got a camera we must make ourselves unique, they're looking for the same opportunity. So uh, having those relationships are great because then it's a person I get to know and I said, okay, we did a great job on that. Now let's, now we have some seniors and some boudoir work coming up and I know you, so let's bring you in for those. So that's, that was really good. The, the other one I thought was a creative, uh, everybody wins solution was for fashion. So I have a lot of fashion designers that come to me and they said, hey, we would like you to shoot our lookbook, you know, and I said, well, what's your budget? And they said, well, we don't have one. We just spent all our money on these really nice fabrics. We have absolutely no money. So I said, okay, here's my solution. Uh, how about you give me two or three different dresses on a rotating basis, and I will shoot my high school seniors in your $1,000, $2,000 gowns, and you can have those pictures for your lookbook. The senior can have a chance to get into something that they typically may not have been able to afford, and I will have something that everyone else in the community does not have, it is in this unique, really unique outfits. Everybody wins. And I, I think that was a really great solution, too, for coming up with uh, networking again in, in an area that normally I would not have an, an opportunity to enter. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, there's that magic word of networking. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you could come up with that win-win scenario, um, I mean, that's, that's who could say no to that? Everybody has a great option in there. 
And so I'm looking at, I'm looking at your images and I mean, these makeup artists, they, I'm looking at your body, body paint portfolio. They really go to town. Like they, Mm -hmm. that is so cool. And I love the creativity. I love the colors. Um, And another thing I'm noticing here is that you really have a handle on your lighting, which would be an understatement. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And and I kind of want to segue into um, talking about how you've built your skill set um, as far as lighting goes, what has that mm-hmm. process been? Because I mean, it's really, your images are stunning. Mm, thank you. Well, I think it comes back to the physics background and not, not to the, the lighting aspect of physics, but the change one variable, see the result, change another variable, see the result. And it was just, again, practice, 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 try and shoot every weekend as often as possible. Uh, I was lucky that there was a, a local photography group here that had a couple models that just like to model. I mean, it's good for their psyche, you know, to be able to get in front of a camera and feel beautiful. And uh, so some people would set up the lights and then I would modify those lights and see, well, what happens if I do this? Oh, well, that's a travesty. Let's not ever do that again. You know, when you, you keep kind of manipulating it. And then we actually got down to doing uh, a very serious challenge. We call it in the studio, we call it a one and done challenge. And it's a hundred dollars to play and you put your hundred dollars down and behind the door, you have no idea what you're going to face. Uh, it's usually a body painted woman, but you have no idea. It could be a pair on a table and you've got, you got 15 minutes and all the lights are back there and an assistant who will do what they're told, but they won't give you any information. And I got a, a bunch of modifiers. So you basically have 15 minutes to set your lights up and you get to take one photograph, one click of the shutter. So there's no t- light test. There's no, and you use a light meter. Obviously you figure out what, modifier you want how far you want to put it from the person and then you get one click of your shutter and then that assistant will take your your card and that is your entry to one and done and then we invite a, a random person who's like the the fire department is right across the street so we usually grab somebody from there and they come over and they will pick the winner and there's no it's all raw right there's no lightroom or photoshop involved and whoever gets it they get all the pile of money you know and we have beer and pizza and we just kind of make it a thing so that <laughs> one and done mentality is one of those, like, can I get it right on the first shot? And that looks really good when you're charging a, a higher amount than, say, your competitor. And you walk up, you take one picture of the scene, and you walk up to the mom and say, what do you think of this? And it's perfect. And it's not, you know, you're not fiddling with your camera at all. Let's try another light test or things like this. And this is, it gives them that, that assurance that, yes, I paid a little extra for this person. But, wow, from the first click of the shutter, I get this amazing picture of my son or daughter. Um, and I think that kind of helps sell that. But it's the game you're always playing in your mind of this is what it's supposed to look like. And hopefully it does. And I've lost that game before, too. You know, that auto ISO will sometimes bite me and I'll have a white picture. And I'm like, oh, there we go. <laughs> that was $100 wasted. <laughs> I oh, love, that's so cool. I Yeah, I love this. I love this one and done. I, I love the concept. I am I am so tired, and we've talked about this in other podcasts too. I'm so tired of meeting people that tell me they're um, natural light specialists. Oh, yeah. Because the minute the minute we hear that, we all know what the truth is. It means you're afraid to get to know studio lighting, or you just haven't had the time. And the truth is that there isn't any artist that isn't a natural light specialist or doesn't love the look and feel of natural light, as opposed to images that are sometime. Um, sometimes filtered over over filtered you know you've got a filter junkie and they're trying to clean up a mess and it's so great when somebody actually understands lighting and like i said we're all natural light we all love the look and feel of natural Mm -hmm. light um period it's it's the ones that that say it in a very pretentious tone that get the biggest eye roll or smile though i'm a natural light photographer (laughs) And you know what I'm, you know what I'm Aww. talking about because it happens. And I used to say, oh, oh you're, we say light limited photographer. Oh, I haven't heard that before. Yeah. Oh, I like that. It's true. It's true. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's just, I'm so impressed by your skill set and oh, it just, the diversity of of jobs that you've had and even your handle on technology. I mean, you're talking about. 3D stuff earlier and NFTs and I just I kind of want to dig into your brain a little bit and see over the course of your creative career or even your career in general um, but especially as it applies to photography uh, what have been some of the big the biggest challenges that you faced as far as I guess grasping technology or changing with the times um, I don't know that I've had any any significant ones there I think that it is 
I'm active enough that as it has changed, I've been open to adopting new things. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like the uh, the print photographer being extremely reticent to sell digitals, for example. Um, and I, you know, as a as a person who likes to see my art on a wall, I sell a lot of physical prints. You know, Gary Box, a very good friend of mine, the the amount of wall prints he sells is is nutty. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many, and I like books. For obviously, for boudoir, we sell a lot of physical books. But I found that it's not so much that people want the digital to share online, which they do, but they want it also kind of like that sense of assurance to say, well, I have a digital in case something were to happen. And it, it's not that they're going to go print it at Walgreens, which, you know, the, the thing that, that I don't want to have happen is my art to be misrepresented. Like, hey, I did a really nice job getting this all color toned and, and exactly how I wanted it. And then you take it someplace that's just going to print it quickly. And then it looks horrible and you hang it on the wall and say, well, this is this is a picture that Scott took. And I'm like, oh, that just makes me cringe. Like I want <laughs> control. Like I use H&H Color Lab, for example, for all my all my prints and H&H. They know me. They know what I want and they know how it's printed. Uh, so when I get it, it's exactly what will represent my art on the wall. But that digital part, that that assurance to the customer to say we are embracing a modern age is something so many people fight. And in my mind, I'm like, you, you're, you're going to lose that battle or you're going to have a very difficult time fighting someone who will allow that as well as the physical print. So uh, that's a really good example of, of the times changing and being able to to embrace that slightly. I mean, the digitals I'm giving away are not the full size ones. You know, I usually give an eight by 10 with each print that they purchase. Mm-hmm. And I, I say, I say, well, they're like, well, can I just buy the digital? I'm like, well, you can, but it comes with a free print. Or if you buy the print, it comes with a free digital. It doesn't matter. The price is the same. You're going to get those two things. Unless you don't want the physical print, well, okay, but you're still paying for it. Um, it's not cheaper because my time is really what you're paying for. Absolutely. And I, I kind of inwardly cringed when you talked about putting all the time and effort into making a digital file photo look perfect an image and then handing it over to the client for them to print themselves at Walgreens because frankly that's what I did oh it had to be Mm -hmm. about 15 years ago so I'm cringing at myself because I know exactly what you mean you put in all that effort and then they go get it printed and it looks horrible and they put Mm -hmm. it on their wall and all of a sudden that is a representation of you and your work for better or for worse and so Mm -hmm. I, I I totally agree with your with, with what you're saying it's oh, so true so true well there, there is a time and a place for that too i mean you said a, a, a young lady who's a big hockey player for example and we printed some five by sevens for like their board when they're going to do their big you know gala night and whatever mm-hmm. and i'm like hey print those at walgreens and put thumb tack holes all through them because that's really where they're going on a board mm-hmm. you know true. and that's i mean there's a time and a place for everything like that but i think embracing Technology, like let's use this three D example um, or the NFT thing. The NFT thing is a little weird, and it may it may change. It's going to evolve over time, but this three D thing is not going away. I mean, the advent mm. of of the three D goggles and you know the the augmented reality, the VR reality, um, all these things are becoming more tuned over time. And they they said that the total of all human knowledge doubles every 11 years. If you look at cell phones 11 years ago, you know what they look like today. 11 years from now, what is that visual universe going to look like? And we obviously represent visuals. Where are we going? And and I think having forward thoughts, being willing to embrace or play with different things rather than being stuck in that, you know, I don't want to be the guy who's still making the stone wheels in town when everybody (laughs) else now has, you know, tires on their car. Um, I want to kind of say, let's let's play with these new things that are coming up. So I'm not surprised when something maybe takes off. Absolutely. Well, there's no question that technology is not going to slow down. Mm-mm. Um, there's also no question that I'm 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 a huge fan of printed work. Um, in fact, I ran a blog post a few days ago, and I have a jump drive in a very sappy picture frame, um, <laughs> just just to make the point. And we've talked about Brian Caparici um, up in the Toronto area who goes to bridal shows and hands brides a five-inch floppy and said, here, take this home and look at some of my work. And they look at him like, what are you talking about? And then he says, exactly. That's why your album is important. That's why prints are important. Um, I love that. Hey, with it, one of the challenges with this podcast is that 
they're just sometimes too short. We're, we're really pretty much down to the minute and just about out of time, but we always have a favorite last question, which is very simple, Scott. What advice would you give a new photographer just starting out today? Learn lighting. I mean, it is not difficult, and, and it's not expensive either. I mean, we're talking about just buy a... <laughs> There's a, a chicken light. We call it a chicken light, one of those metal lights that you used for warming <laughs> eggs. Brian DeMint, phenomenal photographer, sometimes uses this chicken light, and he just bends it in half. And if you look at his work, my God, he's just such an artist, and he uses that light sometimes. Uh, buy a light and just add to whatever you're being given and learn to augment that and you know, obviously move up to strobes at some point. And there's lots of really good entry-level strobes. Like I, I use Molite, for example, as one of my vendors for lights. Uh, I trust Michael with stuff, and I say, this is what I want, and this is what he gives me. And I will go out, and, and again, I'm always learning. You know, I, don't, I can't say no at all. I've got to try new things and, and get more comfortable. But lighting is the way you differentiate yourself in a market saturated with photographers. Everyone literally has a camera. <laughs> The only way to make yourself look different is either amazing composition, lighting, or being able to do something that's just refreshing and new. So lighting is the easiest one of those three to attain in my mind. Great answer. Couldn't agree more. Could Great not answer. agree more. My Good. goodness. <laughs> These interviews, they do. They just fly by too quickly. Oh, that was quick. It's, and I do want to make sure to remember to ask. So, Scott, where would you like our listeners to check out your work online? Sure. Well, it's uh, my name, basically, S-E Detweiler, D-E-T-W-E-I-L-E-R. And that's my website, my Twitter handle, and my Instagram. Oh, very easy. The other the other ones can be found from my website there. My my boudoir brand, Knickers and Knees, is on there. There's um, my product photography stuff, which is, again, getting completely facelifted right now uh, to a news and folio site. And then uh, my senior stuff. So it's all on there. Fantastic. And we'll make sure to include those links in the show notes as well. Thank you. And Skip, where can folks hunt you down? It's always the same answer. Everything I write is at skipcohenuniversity.com. And I'm Skip Cohen on Facebook and Skip Cohen on Twitter. And my email is skip at mei and the number 500.com. Because if you've got any suggestions or critiques or ideas of topics or people you'd like us to have on as guests, um, please let us know. A big thanks to Zenfolio today because um, talking yes. with them, they kind of said, you know, you ought to talk to Scott Detweiler. He's got doing some cool stuff. So a big thanks out to them. And Shamira, where do they go to find you? Folks can send me an email at shamira at photofocus.com. That is my first name, C-H-A-M-I-R-A -A at photofocus.com. Frankly, I have a bunch of different email addresses, and they all go to the same inbox. So um, you can hit me up there. We love getting questions, ideas, feedback, suggestions for future guests to have on the show. And uh, with that said, Scott, we just want to thank you again. This has been awesome. Just well, thank awesome you. chatting yeah. with you. You shared so much good insight today. I really appreciate it. Well, it was, was a great time. Great. Well, thank you. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> it's a party. And yeah. we want to thank our listeners for joining us as well. Please tell your friends about this podcast, especially if they have the burning desire to bring their photography business to the next level here in 2022. We look forward to having you with us next time on the Mind Your Own Business podcast, brought to you by Photofocus and Skip Cohen University. 